Thank you for everyone who could make it. Um, I'm just gonna say a little bit about Creator, Creator Square first for those of you who are a little less familiar with, with our organization and what we do. And then I'll hand it over to Adam Kinney. Creator Square is an artisan residency located in the Park View building in the heart of downtown Johnstown, an authentic historical manufacturing town emerging as an epicenter for the arts and crafts. It was created as an opportunity for makers to grow artistic practices into small batch manufacturing businesses and is a part of a larger network of Johnstown based artists and crafts organizations aiming to help revitalize the local community. The program was envisioned by and supported through a number of organizations, Carnegie Mellon University, Community Foundation for the Alleghenies, JARI, Southern Alleghenies Planning and Development Commission, Startup Alleghenies, Discover Downtown Johnstown Partnership, Entrepreneurial Alchemy, and the Johnstown Redevelopment Authority. Funding sources for the approximately $750,000 project include the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, the U.S. Economic Development Administration, the U.S. Department of Defense, Cambria County Government, Community Foundation for the Alleghenies, and private donations. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Adam Kinney uh, from Creative Business Accelerator and um, Bridgeway Capital to present on HyperObject. Thanks, Taylor. Um, happy to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And it looks like I just need you to enable that. Okay. Okay. I'm looking for it. I apologize. I'm not, I'm not seeing where I can do that. Sorry about that. All right, there we go. You should be able to now. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay, here we go. It looks like we're ready to go. Uh, thanks again, Taylor, um, and thank you to Creator Square for inviting me to speak uh, this evening about the subject. Uh, Creator Square, uh, as you heard uh, Taylor describe, is a really dynamic project, and uh, the CBA and Bridgeway Capital are really excited to be um, supporters of the project and partners of the project. So, hello, uh, my name is Adam Kenny. Um, I am the director of the Creative Business Accelerator at Bridgeway Capital. Uh, I'm also a maker myself. I've got about 21 years of experience as a glass maker. Eight of it was professional in production and academic settings. Uh, I spent three years uh, at the Appalachian Center for Craft studying multiple craft processes uh, and mixed media sculpture. The slide of some of my current work, semi-current, also a couple of years old. I don't get into the studio as much as I used to. Um, but I have a Master of Arts Management degree from CMU, and I've been in an arts admin capacity for quite a while now, three years as ED of Touchstone Center for Crafts, and again, five years plus as the director of the, um, what was the Craft Business Accelerator, is now the Creative Business Accelerator for Joy Capital. And I guess uh, the point, besides uh, just introducing the speaker, introducing myself, is for um, the makers on this uh, presentation to understand that I too am a maker. So some of the concepts that I'll be uh, sharing with you are not some economic development bureaucrat telling you uh, how to be a maker, right? These are, these are things that I inherently as a, as a creative individual see value in. And they also have value as uh, on creative entrepreneurs try to uh, make what they're doing financially re resilient. So we'll dive right into it. Uh, we have a quick agenda for tonight. Um, first, we want to define what a creative business is, like who you potentially are, uh, who the folks we serve are. Next, we want to explain what the creative, creative Business Accelerator is. And this is all really in 
important context for understanding why we're encouraging folks to think about their, um, their creative output as a hybrid object. So that's the why, right? And then finally, the how uh, we'll actually explore some really interesting case studies of, of makers that are really um, finding that sweet spot between form and function, subtext and uh, usefulness. And then finally, if we have time, we'll have a little bit of Q&A. So creative business owner can mean different things to different folks, but for the sake of this conversation, for the sake of the CBA, it's an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial artist, craftsperson, maker, designer working to achieve three main goals for us, right, for the CBA. Creative fulfillment, we want you to feel good about what you're doing. Financial resilience means we want you to be able to make a good living at it. And then the highest, um, the, the final goal then is social impact, right? Can you, can you do good through your creative practice beyond the object? So um, an easy way to think about it is we help folks make a product, make a living, and then make an impact, right? Good examples of some of the folks we work with is Atia Jones. Uh, she is actually a self-taught illustrator. You can see a beautiful example of her imagery on the right-hand side. But this is not from a hand-drawn uh, artwork. This is actually commercial grade wallpaper. So she was able to make these, this beautiful pattern and then work with the manufacturers to create a scalable design that could be applied to a commercial wallpaper and used by a whole new class of uh, audience for her. Next, we have makers. Um, these are curve case. These are folks that come out of a uh, tech shop or makerspace type settings. They use a lot of CNC controlled equipment. A good example is uh, this phone case, case that they make, which is used from reclaimed, reclaimed uh, Pennsylvania sourced wood, but they're making a skin essentially for a, product, a technological product, right? So really fascinating, very 21st century form of making. Next, we have craftspeople. Uh, a good example is Studebaker Metals. As you can see, there's actual anvils in the picture. So this is a 21st century business that is using techniques that are thousands of years old, but they're doing it very su successfully because they're uh, leveraging some sophisticated marketing and selling their products in Tokyo and Paris and other places where Made in Pittsburgh is cool. Finally, we have designers uh, like Ruth Design Build. This is Rob, he's actually a um, Union Carpenter, who aspires to create products. And Rob loves making, but also knows it's difficult to scale when you have to make everything by hand. So is looking for manufacturers to make some of the designs that you can see here on the right-hand side. So I gave you three examples or four examples of the bigger buckets that we use to define creative businesses. And these are actually real people we work with that sort of apply that. So, um, just to be thorough, let's make sure we all continuously understand what a CB is for us. So a lot of times with uh, uh, artists or self-identifying self artists or creatives, um, the, the term entrepreneurialism or, or entrepreneur isn't as always commonly understood. So I think it's really important when we talk about the CBA's goals, uh, get extra clear on that, even that term. So relating to someone who starts their own business or is good at seeing new opportunities to make money. And our argument here is you can have creative fulfillment and do this and be an entrepreneur. And second, a lot of creatives that sell work and pay taxes on the revenues still don't consider themselves necessarily a business. Like there's a, a stigma to that term that um, for some reason takes away from uh, their creativity or their artistry. But in reality, according to the IRS, like anyone that sells a product and pays taxes on it, you are a business, right? It's the activity of buying and selling goods and services. So it seems sort of basic um, that we would have to cover things like this, but we're really getting creatives in the CBA from a lot of different places. And so it's, uh, it's important when we ask folks to grow a business that we all have a shared vocabulary. Another interesting statistic is uh, a lot of self-identifying artists or folks that are coming from art or design or craft backgrounds are actually predisposed to become self-employed, to be, um, become small businesses. So even though there's this tension of creatives maybe not wearing to wear that hat, the reality is, I guess you could say the irony is, is they're, out, they're predisposed to be small business owners. 
They'll use some of the folks that we work with. We have about 500 folks in our network so far, and everyone has a very specific pathway, a very specific um, approach to materials and process. So moving right along. Um, all right, now we have a shared understanding of what a creative business is for the CBA. What does it mean to be accelerated as a creative business? So uh, as Taylor mentioned, I actually work for a social impact investor called Bridgeway Capital. It sounds very ominous. I promise you it's not. We are a community development financial institution. We are one of the good guys, right? We are nonprofit social impact investor. We put about 100 million, we have 100 million in capital under management. We serve all of Western PA, ironically not Cambria County. <laughs> it technically is not one of our counties, but that doesn't matter. We're here anyway, because we really believe in Crater Square and Jones County. And we do approximately 20 million per year in grants and loans. So it could be a $5,000 loan to a, a urban entrepreneur looking to make an improvement on uh, one of their contracting trucks all the way up to a $3 million deal uh, to help uh, a nonprofit art center uh, purchase the building that they were going to take. So a really wide range of activities. Um, but we do focus on commercial real estate, real estate and small businesses. And we also own and operate two light industrial buildings ourselves. So we understand uh, the joys and the pains of uh, operating a building with artists in it as we So uh, at its core, I just threw out a lot of bullets and what Bridgeway Capital is about. But really, if you can take away anything about who I work for is that we are interested in equitable economic development, right? Empowering underserved entrepreneurs, minority women-owned, veteran-owned businesses with capital and capability, and also attracting and supporting economic activity in disinvested areas. And I think Creator Square is a great example of a type of project uh, that we would totally support and do support. Johnstown is a, well, a year ago, it was unfortunately labeled uh, the poorest small city in Pennsylvania. Uh, and we have Taylor, who is a woman-owned creative business. So by supporting Creator Square, we're technically supporting both. So we're checking out both boxes for Bridgeway. But that's a, lot of, that's a lot of times how we look at an opportunity that comes across us. It definitely has to pass that mission test in order for us to engage. So moving right up, uh, again, my employer is Bridgeway Capital, but I run a program called the CBA. We help makers using these six essential elements, um, space, capital, peers, markets, assistance, and workforce. And you can see we actually track numbers associated with each to show our impact. On the top right-hand side, you can see the two buildings we, oh, um, we have. One is 150,000 square feet, former Westinghouse facility, and the other one is called Pickles, smaller building in McKees Rocks, about the size of Crater Square, actually. And then we have three sub-programs that we run, pg and Origins and Monument. So no matter what, again, going back to that main um, those top three goals, we empower creative businesses to achieve those three things. Creative fulfillment, do what you love, financial resilience, make a living at it, and social impact. You know, as a successful creative business owner, what social good can you have beyond, you know, personal expression? And that, as you can see, moving from the bottom to the top, first, we will want folks to earn a living wage. I think we all know makers that Sell a lot of stuff, but it doesn't always turn into a living wage, let alone a sustained salary. Then we help folks start thinking about um, growing their small business after they achieve that uh, financial resilience. Then we start thinking about uh, helping them do bigger moves like revitalizing main streets like Creator Square or reactivating industrial spaces. And finally, you know, can Taylor and folks like her get to a spot where they're so busy doing all the things, all those four bullets below that they need to create and preserve jobs. That is like the, the really the, the golden thing for us. Excuse me. So as I said before, we have those six elements, right? And no matter what the CBA does, it's really, if you just think about us that way, then you know all you need to know, right? Markets, assistance, workforce, capital, space, peers. That's what we provide. But every maker, just like um, their creative output, whether it's pottery or performance art, they're coming to us with different needs. So they go to these six elements um, and they come out of it with a very uh, unique solution. And we call that per personalized pathways for success. A good example here is Jowdy. 
studio, AJ's and Ceramicist, as you can see. And in the background, you can see he is a shared studio. This is actually an older picture, a union project in Pittsburgh. And now he's at that old building I showed you, 7800. He's received an R&D grant from us. We've gotten into him into a couple projects and he's participated in the falling water project. Again, this is AJ's. AJ's pathway looks like nobody else's but AJ's. Good example here, another one is Cam J Metalworks. Ramon got a working capital loan from Bridgeway. He's been included in several projects. Also did per participate in the falling water project and was connected to a proto haven and makerspace um, to enhance his production, right? Very different from AJ. And then finally, the last example is Kelly Lane. Another side of the spectrum, we have someone that's in textiles and apparel. Again, had a very personalized pathway for success, but always going up to those six elements and taking what they need. So our, our main goal when we work with uh, all of those uh, creative entrepreneurs, and they have those six different elements, there's a lot going on. So we have to find a way to show that the creative business has changed over time because of our positive intervention, right? So that's why we have a system called the Creative Business Lab. And folks, when they start working with us, will actually take what's called the CBL survey, which asks financial, operational, and attitudinal questions like, are you feeling good about your growth? How do you make money? How much money are you making? Right, just 25 questions to just get like, it's like a blood test for the creative business, right? It's a diagnostic to help us understand where they are at any moment in time. And it generates a score, and that score has a label. So some folks come out at it starting, some that are more experienced come through at scaling. What's really interesting is folks that think they're farther along, maybe they have really slick website, but after they take the survey, they find that um, maybe they're more in the starting or emerging based on the CBL survey questions. Our goal though, no matter what, is to help those creative businesses and to provide them access with that capital, peers, workforce, et cetera, to get them to the impact zone, right? This is when we start to see the characteristics or the increased likelihood that the businesses are achieving those outcomes that Bridgewood cares about, right? Earning that living wage, growing that small business, et cetera. So a lot of times folks will look at this and say, whoa, I'm a, I'm a painter. I don't want to become a manufacturer. That's totally fine. That may not be your pathway, but we at least need to get folks to the sustaining level, right? If you are a painter and you make 15 paintings a year and they each sell for $10,000 each, that's got to at least get you to where you're sustaining, right? Um, after folks get past that, it's kind of up to them if they want to think about scaling and manufacturing. But again, the lowest level we get folks to is sustaining. What we don't want to see is that someone just stay stuck in emerging for one, two, three cycles, which are basically six months increments. Something's not working on our end or on their end. But the good thing is, is the survey allows us kind of that objective snapshot to say, hey, this, this part, these financials haven't changed, or you, know, you haven't worked on this part of your operational approach. It's a really nice way to sort of leave the discussion. And because we are a CDFI, we're very data-driven and we have a whole back-end system called our impact management system that we track all those numbers with. And so we can tell your story as an individual business over time, but we can also tell uh, the story of all the creative businesses in our sector as a, as a sector. So our big picture goal is um, to push back against what's called smokestack chasing. And Jonestown is actually a really good example of the challenges of smokestack chasing. You know, the city, the small city was sort of built on several key large employers, mills, creating all the jobs. And what happens when some of those folks go away because of global uh, mar um, market conditions, right? A lot of people are instantly unemployed. We had a conversation with some folks in Morgantown and uh, Milan, which has been there for like decades in Morgantown is, is a huge employer is leaving in July. 1500 jobs evaporate on July 31st. So while it's exciting to bring in a big employer to create a lot of FTEs, full-time equivalents, our approach is different. Can we work with smaller creative businesses and empower them and get them confident and excited about growth so they individually can hire not 50 to 100, but maybe five to 10, right? Over the period of their entire career. 
And as you can see, if one or two businesses over time don't make it, which is actually you know, how it goes for small businesses, 50% go away after three years, um, it's a little bit easier to visualize how the system is robust and you can replace those entities with new businesses over time. So again, we're not Luddites. We realize that the future is still gonna be about the big, the big employers that are gonna come to the industrial parks around Johnstown to create those large jobs. There's still large manufacturers in Johnstown that hire lots of people and they are essential. Creator Square is a good example though of how you know, folks like Taylor and some of the other residents that will activate that space are, are good to go into spaces where big companies just can't be, but can still bring innovation and can still bring impact to a place like Johnson. So moving right along, we're almost to the, to the hybrid object. <laughs> so as we said before, uh, we have three sub initiatives that are really important to our programming. And oftentimes they're how people come to the CBA because they have their own websites, they have and so it's important for us to outline what they are. So first we have PG&H, uh, which a number of makers, 100 of them are actually featured on, which is our sort of umbrella brand for the region. Then we have two sub-programs that are specifically tailored for specific economic development goals. So PG&H, pg&h.org, feel, um, feel free to check it out. Uh, it is, uh, I guess you could call it a brand for uh, our makers in the region. We have a hundred plus on there now. We do all the profile photography. So it's all, the branding is really consistent, polished, it's a very good looking website. Um, it embodies the brand values of being inclusive, Pittsburgh's background of making, the region's background of making, and of course, high design and contemporary aesthetics. And we have an actual store in downtown Pittsburgh, a uh, concept store where some of the products of the makers online are sold. Good example of the shop. Okay. Next, we have Origins. Again, earlier when I mentioned Bridgeway Capital, it's motivated by under uh, elevating underserved entrepreneurs. It's not just the tech sector that has big time equity issues, it's also craft, art, and design. So we wanted to create Origins, which levels the playing field for makers of color. So again, it increases and expands opportunity for black creatives. Uh, it's a website, but it's also a multifaceted effort and that adds extra layers of support. And again, it provides that deeper level of support for underserved entrepreneurs. Some good examples, there's T again, an exhibition we have with some work by Laverne. Then finally, we have Monmade. Um, Monmade used to be the umbrella brand with all the directory, but we noticed over time that we had different goals for it. We wanted it to be a bridge between uh, real estate developments um, and makers that wanted to go into that sector to scale. You guys have a really great example of one of our early projects in Johnstown, which is the Balanced Restaurant. All the tables and the lighting actually um, came from two Pittsburgh-based makers. And both of those projects are really instrumental, especially with stack ceramics that made the lighting in, in getting them sort of out of a certain type of object making into another type of object making, which was a UL listed commercial lighting. So again, it's more set up for the design and development professionals. Um, it's not as easy to participate in because sending pendant lights to a $40 million development, there's a lot of things that you have to get right in order to participate in that game. And it's also where we're pushing a lot of our sustainability work. We just launched a program called Sustainability Monmade, and we're hopefully gonna be rolling it out to a bunch of different types of makers where they can go through their practice and essentially get um, an audit of if their practices are sustainable or not and how they can improve it. Again, the goal here, a high level goal is, can makers become, have triple bottom line impact? Which means, can they make a good living? Can they have social good? And they, can they do no harm from an environmental standpoint? That would be the highest goal for us. As you can see, um, some images from the website. This is, this is actually a photograph from one of our design exhibitions um, a couple of years ago and come with some of the makers that were represented. And as you can see, it, you know, it looks like a showroom that you might wander into in the design district of uh, New York now. That's the goal. All right, finally to the, the heart of the presentation. Taylor, how much, how much time do I have according to Zoom? Er, thought I had an answer. You still have about 
20 minutes, I think. Okay, good. Perfect. We're fine then. Yeah. All right. So that's a lot of context. Um, and some of you have at, may have seen some of that before if you sat in on a CBA orientation. Um, it still doesn't hurt to, to understand what our motivations are when we ask people to start thinking about their work as a hybrid object. So what is the hybrid object? It means a couple of things, right? It's a logical extension of the artist's creativity, but it also gives them access to new markets and new sources of revenue. And it is supported by manufacturing practices. A lot of those things are really new for makers that are sort of leveraging handmade processes when they approach this. Uh, but these are the three main elements that we think create what's called the hybrid object. Um, so a lot of times folks, I'm not gonna play this video, we don't have time. <laughs> I've been binge watching this for, for days now. <laughs> yeah, this is one of my favorite skits from Portlandia. And it's these, this couple that comes into a little boutique and they're like, put a bird on it, right? And sometimes uh, artists uh, that don't want to quote unquote sell out, when they hear, first hear about the hybrid object, they think this is what I'm asking them to do, right? Just sort of be too on trend, do something gimmicky um, in order to grow in ways that isn't appropriate for them. And that is not what I'm trying to do. But I'm just trying to get past this slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Put a bird on it. Great. Yeah, I was going to queue up that video, but I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? People it's can watch fitting it. that it was like hard to get rid of. <laughs> it was. This is what I get for trying to trying to put YouTube to a PowerPoint. So here's what it's about, though, right? It's not about putting a bird on thing, anything. It's about authentically extending your aesthetic, right? Doing things that allow you to pursue new opportunities in innovative ways, but don't take you too far from what you feel uh, in terms of your personal expression. So good example is a curve case who I brought up before. It was an example of a maker. So they have these wonderful little um, pencil cup holders, I guess you could say. And we worked with them uh, to take this really innovative, in interesting, beautiful design that is very true to what they did. And they scaled it up to make pendant lighting for commercial applications. Again, not something that they had thought about before, but a completely different application for something that they designed and believe in. Next, we have Gavin Benjamin. So Gavin Benjamin does a lot of photo photography and illustration, and this is gonna be kind of an anticlimactic hybrid object. So <laughs> it's the same thing. But the, the point is, is previously, Gavin Benjamin was a strictly one-of-a-kind artist, right? And what he's done, though, is, and that's great when you can find a buyer that is, the, or the market that can support buying the one-of-a-kind thing, but Gavin wanted to sort of break out and start collaborating with interior designers on larger commercial projects. So he had to go out and find a manufacturing partner um, that could capture the original, uh, the quality of the original, but translate it into a variety of different applications, ranging from wall covers, wall vinyls, um, all the way down to, um, you know, multiple prints that could be done on metal. In fact, we gave Gavin a small research and development grant so he could have some of these designs printed on metal, again, to give the interior designers he was working with, not individual art buyers, more flexibility, more options, lower price points. But still, authentically Gavin's aesthetic. Here we have Ashley Cecil. She is a you know, beautifully, classically trained illustrator, painter, does gorgeous work. Same thing though, is selling one of a kind work in galleries, but was looking for new ways to diversify her revenue. So took her aesthetic and very authentically, you know, applied it to textile and wall covering designs. And these have been used in a number of different uh, residential and commercial settings. She's even had fabric printed and has made apparel. So again, like was on a canvas strictly up to a certain point, but was able to work with um, manufacturers to take that aesthetic and apply to uh, uh, translate it to different applications. Here we go, Maya Lepo, who I know is um, a Crater Square on the advisory committee at least. We're a huge fan. She actually just is was selected for our next league program. 
got big, big aspirations for Maya. She's a jewelry maker, makes really just super dynamic contemporary jewelry. Again, was interested in accessing new markets. So she partnered with a manufacturer who were um, E.H. Schwab, which is in Turtle Creek, Turtle Creek, and was able to take her sort of personal aesthetic and translate it to a line of uh, home decor goods, right? There's my, me, talk about myself. Again, like I'm not telling people what to do. I walk the walk. I have a line of glass vessels. I've not really thought outside of that, but I had a friend that I collaborated with, with recently, Brian Farrell, who's a really awesome artist and uh, educator at Seton Hill. And we had a small company together for a while called F and K. This is some of the lighting that we did, did together. And I'd never done lighting up to that point. And working outside of my comfort zone for a different application um, was very eye-opening uh, for me and has really allowed me to take more creative risks. That's the business I'm trying to launch right now, Shapes of the Wall. Hmm. So um, here's a good kind of hybrid object case study and applications. So I think I mentioned before that Mon made works to bring makers into um, real estate development projects, both large and small. We've worked on $70 million uh, apartment projects like the Glass House in Pittsburgh and things as small as uh, Balance in Johnstown. A good, another good example of the community land trust homes. Done by Lawrenceville Corporation was the nonprofit developer. RDC was the, um, was the uh, architect. Ecocraft Homes um, was also one of the developers. And of course, Monmain was a partner. As you can see, these are super cool. These have high mission and high design. They are, um, not only do they look attractive, but they're, uh, as part of the community land trust, are permanently affordable. So folks had to sort of qualify for these uh, in terms of their income in order to buy them. And it keeps a Lawrenceville, which is a, a, a community in Pittsburgh that's becoming increasingly expensive. It keeps it um, affordable uh, for normal people. <laughs> Um, so a good example of Bones and All, another business that we work with, there's Kelsey. Um, they made, at that point, almost strictly consumer products like candle holders and cutting boards. But for this project, they made these really interesting mailboxes uh, that were used on all six units. And not only are they wood, but they're uh, sheet steel as well. And they had to have the sheet steel components manufactured for them and powder coated. And now... You can't ask Bones and All to make you a cutting board now. They are strictly in that real estate development space doing very large pro projects now. And now they've been able to hire and lease a larger space. Another good example is Vessel Studio. I used to work for them at a grad school, um, helping Drew and Janine blow glass. And I, and I was teaching lessons, a great little studio on the south side. They have these wonderful little cups uh, based on... Um, Andy Warhol's sort of soup cans. Um, again, we worked with them to turn that design and have to custom mold CNC, turn this small little cup into like a seven by 11 inch uh, glass um, window, excuse me, uh, pendant light shade that is UL listed. They are in the house and they're gorgeous. Another example, Modesto Studio, screen printing shop, pretty much doing t-shirts. That's what screen printers do. But we challenged them to sort of take that technology, take that process and have a bunch of different settings, uh, applications for it. So not only did they do um, screen printing for t-shirts, but they did a lot of props for the Pittsburgh film industry. And as you can see for this project, they actually did screen printed hardy board, right? Screen printed uh, hardy board that was used on the exterior of the building. And you can see what a beautiful um, pattern that left. And it's actually modeled off of the years of, um, What's a wallpaper? If you go into an old abandoned house, you'll kind of go into a room that looks like it has generations of wallpaper applied. It's supposed to sort of capture that. Because that's what a lot of these um, sites look like before Lawrenceville Corporation secured them. Finally, the last example is Braddock Tiles, um, who's someone, Katie Johnson from my team actually used to run Braddock Tiles. But it's a great example of uh, objects that can do good. So Braddock Tiles uh, was a um, social enterprise where they used tile production to do workforce development for young people in Braddock. 
So here's a good example of a ceramics process, a ceramics object, um, but it actually creates social good. And we were able to get them specced into a number of different projects, including the community land trust homes. So by this ceramic object being made by ceramicists that normally made plates and bowls, by them rethinking the tile process is something that was easier to teach youth and that had architectural applications, they were able to accomplish a social good. Oops, that's one of the students. So to sort of wrap this up, right? Basically, I'm just asking folks to be designers, right? Be sort of process agnostic because design fosters two things, scalability and sustainability. And design is the creative language of manufacturing. So, um, and Taylor, if we have time, I'd be interested to, to learn about your process because um, I, have been, I thought about you when I was putting this deck together based on the last visit we had, um, because you, know, you were talking about working with 3D um, rendering software and then using a 3D printer to take a handmade object. So, I mean, you were working on a hybrid object for sure. So I'd like to hear your thoughts at the end. And we were very close to that. Um, so in, in, to summarize, you know, basically we're encouraging makers to really get outside of their own two hands and think about those manufacturing practices and partnerships. Um, and again, by doing so, you start to realize all of those things that are important, um, economic development outcomes, personal business growth outcomes, and really can only happen until you start um, building your team, thinking outside your two hands. So at that point, that sort of wraps it up. And I sort of have some folks didn't have questions for me, which sometimes happen. I sort of throw up some, some questions for the audience. Taylor, uh, why, we have a few minutes left, and then I know you have to get on to something. But I be, think it'd be interesting for you to sort of outline your journey with the hybrid object. Yeah, well, I mean, I always loved just making anything when I was in school, especially if it was something I didn't already know how to make. I like that challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, I don't know, when I when I came here to Creator Square, I was like, this is just perfect. You know, like, I love making artwork that is meant to be artwork, but mm -hmm. I like making all kinds of stuff and making it well and, you know, making it from an artist's perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I mean, like, I also can only make so much with my hands because I only have two of them, but also because they're not machines. And so like if I break them, they're not gonna work the same. So like, it's really, really hard on my wrists and my thumbs and mm. my, my back to do the work that I do every single day consistently. And, um, and I mean, I, if, I, if I could, I would. I, would, I would just like do this 24 seven, like just right sure. here. But I can't yeah. and that's okay. Cause I don't wanna hurt my body. Um, and I do like yeah. doing other things. So I figured I'd use some technologies if I could figure out how to learn them, which I'm, I'm making it, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm learning a little bit here and there um, to kind of take some of that uh, process out of my hands, you know, because yeah. <laughs> it's just too much. I, and I mean, there's also more processes that uh, can't be 3D printed that I'd also like to take out of my hands by employing a few people as well. Um, but yeah, the idea of taking certain objects that do not need to be made by my hand or any hand that are just a really nice design. Um, you know, I know there's certain universities and there was, there was like, there were professors that felt this way at my university that if you're not making it by hand, it's like, you know, you're kind of entering into the world of manufacturing and that's not cool and that's not art and that's not mm -hmm, good mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Um, yeah but I think that that's just like destructive thinking. It's the opposite of creative thinking. It's the opposite of using what you have to do your best with, you know? Yeah, and it's not like, it's not like flex shafts have been around for thousands of years, right? That is technology. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. And so I think putting up those walls maybe helps some people problem solve because structure is nice sometimes, yeah. but uh, tearing down the walls is liberating too, obviously, and and yeah. so I'm I'm working to tear down those walls because as a metalsmith, I mean, like 
my peers and professors, I'm sure there's some that feel like, Taylor, you're a metalsmith, you know, don't get too far away from that. But I will always love to make jewelry and I always will. Yeah. Be. And I will sure. have my hands working better for a longer period of time to make those really important pieces. Yeah. Um, and, and on the side, I, I also love to design and it doesn't have to be all within my hands. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that what you just described embodies this statement perfectly. Like, unless you can grow more arms, like two hands, it's, it's not a, sc a scalable tool set, right? Um, and from a sustainability standpoint, I have heard that from metalsmiths, from glass blowers, from ceramicists. Craft processes are notoriously hard on the body. Yeah. So if you really want to be in this for the long haul, you have to find ways to take the pressure off your most important tool, which is your mind and your body. And yeah. technology, technology can do that. And it's really an important flip to switch or switch to flip when you start to think about this, this technology as, as part of your creative process, right? Yeah. Yep, 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 it's true. And I don't know, maybe that's, I'm, I have this nervousness of, you know, when, when new residents come in here, what if they're really resistant to that? Because it's definitely what we've all been taught to some degree. Um, yeah. And, you know, how, I think what you just said was, was really good, that, that in order to use your best tool, you have to take care of it and free it up yeah. to be used. And I mean, you, so you, you need some tools to do that, just like we've been using tools, you know, all, all everything we use is a tool. Yeah, and the funny thing is, is like in the conceptual art world, in the artiest of art world, there's plenty of people using technology to tell stories. And to, so it's, it's really, sometimes it's sort of crafts baggage, I think, yeah. rather than fine art um, or conceptual art. But yeah, it's definitely baggage that people bring to the table from the handmade world, for sure. Well, in the interest of time, I, I want you to be able to sort of set up your exhibition and get ready for Saturday. Um, yeah, do you think we're, we're okay here? Is there anything else? Yeah, I have a couple of questions for you um, when, sure. when we close this down, but I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and, and uh, end this for the sake of the, the video to be posted. So thank you so much, Adam. That was a fantastic talk. It was really exciting. I've, it's making my brain buzz, which is why I want you to stay on for just a couple moments after this recording. We really appreciate sure. this. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Go Creators Corner.